Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay no so, uh, hey, yeah. great. Um, so, thanks for letting me talk. So, I'm I'm uh, going to talk to you about HTTP2 and uh, Node.js. So, um, I'm going to run through a little bit of details on um, you know what is HTTP2 and uh, what does it mean to do that with Node.js. What is actually Node.js for some of you have sort of not used Node before because uh, this is an open source conference about all kinds of technologies. Um, I'm going to talk about the JavaScript, the pure JavaScript implementations of HTTP2 in Node that are available on NPM. That's the Node Package Manager. So you can use that and they've been around for probably three, four years now. They started as a Google Summer of Code projects um, and now you can sort of use them to build your server app, use both of the sort of most popular uh, versions in uh, some, some projects that I'm doing and I'll share my experience. And then I'll talk about the upcoming native support and what it, what it means to be native in Node anyway um, for HTTP2. So that's what we're going to cover in the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, first of all, why would we need to fix HTTP1? What's wrong with HTTP1? Well, so there's a couple of main things. Um, if you're new to HTTP2, basically with HTTP1, you're not really using TCP IP effectively. You're um, you know, ramping up multiple sockets. You're taking like six or eight or whatever. Uh, sockets to request a whole bunch of uh, assets. Each of those needs to ramp up you know, to its uh, speed that's built into the TCP you know, sort of fundamentals, the algorithms in TCP that determine how fast you can request a lot of data and receive a lot of data. How many, you know, sort of um, how, how do you respond to you know, drops, of, you know, pack, packets that get dropped or latency um, and sort of that's not really the right way to do it by opening up multiple sockets. One socket would be ideal. Um, things like, like when you have one request you have to wait for its response before you can send the next request, right? So this kind of blocking means that you're going to have compounding latency. So if you have you know, a, 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 a request that goes around, around the world, you're going to be doing like 300, 400 milliseconds, then the second request will be, a, a, again, that amount of time that you're waiting, it becomes very noticeable, it becomes basically impossibly expensive to do lots of lots of uh, small requests. So people come up with all these hacks, like bundling things with like, things like Webpack and whatever. And those are great solutions for HTTP1 world, but in HTTP2, you, you, know, you shouldn't have to use that anymore. That's one of the things that have been addressed at a protocol layer and are now sort of taken for granted. Uh, other things like it's plain text, um, uses new line text, which is really nice if you're just reading the socket with like a packet sniffer or something, but these days we've got much more advanced debugging tools. Few people really look at the raw data on the network. Even if you're using the network tab in your browser debugger inspector tool, uh, the network tab is already parsing that for you and showing a sort of more polished version of that. So the value of looking at plain text is kind of like diminished these days. And um, there could be potential gains by using binary, um, you know, binary uh, uh, packetization, uh, turning things into frames that go into streams, and this is sort of the approach that HTTP2 takes. Uh, another thing is the headers. If you're doing lots and lots of requests with HTTP2, or HTTP1, let's say, you, you know, Every one of these requests and responses has a set of headers. Extremely repetitive data, if you looked at it, across requests. And so if that's uncompressed, then you're wasting potentially lots of bandwidth. Um, so HP2 solves a lot of these things. Now you've got sort of interleaved streams rather than multiple sockets. One socket at the TCP level, you can send lots and lots of requests and responses as sort of the streams construct. So it basically chops your requests and responses into little uh, frames, uh, various types of frames and then we'll sort of send them over the same socket. So you can have like 100 requests going on at the same time and 100 responses coming back at any given time and they can all happen sort of inter interleaved. So you can have a little bit of this request, a little bit of that response and it can all go at the same time uh, both directions. Um, actually, I say 100 because that's actually the sort of the default minimum built into the spec of how many should be supported by any implementation. So like it's kind of unheard of to do 100 sockets in HTTP 1 but in HTTP 2 it's like the minimum. Um, not that you have to do that, but every implementation should support that. And that's kind of a, an important thing when you look at the performance of these things. They're not always defined, like, sort of really tested for that. Um, so again, like I said, binary frames where you're chopping all these things up. And then header compression is now built into the protocol. So just like you probably use gzip or uh, some other uh, compression to compress the payload, you can now also use hpack, which is sort of the, the default algorithm, to compress your HTTP headers. Um, so that covers sort of HTTP 1, why we need to. Now Node.js, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is just running JavaScript on a server. So just like you would run PHP code or Python code or you know, Java or .NET, you can now just run JavaScript on the code. It's nothing really new, uh, but again, I just want to point that out. Now in Node, it's kind of important to realize that when Node came out so many years ago, HTTP was 
sort of the killer app for Node. Like there's nothing inherent in JavaScript that says it should talk about the, that it should talk and support HTTP. But Node did that, and that made it extremely successful at building web apps, building APIs. You know, it has all the sort of asynchronous callback-based semantics of um, of JavaScript, you know, sort of natively because of the language. But then giving it a couple of sort of sort of standard libraries, you could call them, including HTTP, has made it sort of the default. Um, like the hello world example on Node's homepage literally is just this, this like 10 or so lines of code that builds a web server. Like where you previously would have to do Apache and set up, or set up Nginx and then run your application behind that, proxy it, upstream it, do whatever. Now it's just a couple of lines of code and you have your own server. You know, this is, this is the hello world of Node. And so the very first line of the hello world of Node is HTTP. And that's why I think it's important to look at the new version of the protocol. What does that mean for Node when it's so crucial, so critical to Node? Um, so there's two, uh, like I said, two um, packages on NPM. Again, that's the uh, sort of the package uh, manager for Node. Um, NPM stands for a lot of things, but I guess most people typically see a package manager. Now you can download you know, millions and millions of packages there. And so sort of these two, Node HTTP2 and Node Speedy, Speedy is the former name of HTTP2, sort of the short answer there. Um, both of these have been around for a couple of years and very popular, like hundreds of thousands, millions of downloads every month. And um, I've sort of played with both of them now. And uh, I found that they're great for sort of my, doing my little personal experimentation um, with the protocol and what it can do, you know, what it could potentially do, sort of like build proof of concepts. But when I try to run it in production, I find, you know, serious performance issues, um, you know, kind of hard to work around some of the API limitations and how they're set up. Because again, these are like sort of implementations of a spec, not necessarily useful to developers. So designing an API versus implementing a spec are two different things, and, and so that comes through iterating. And so multiple people building these a these APIs around this protocol is going to um, come up with better, you know, sort of new patterns for how to use HTTP effectively. Because there's not just the, the benefits that I talked about earlier, but there's some new sort of primitives in the protocol that you can now use, like server push. You can push assets from the server to the client that are not requested yet by the client because you're sort of anticipating them. Um, so the first one, Node HTTP2. Um, it's got a really clean API. If you're familiar with the, the Hello World example, the API for this library is almost exactly the same, and it's it works fairly well. It doesn't really crash once you've kind of figured out all the errors that you need to trap and uh, all the tries and catches that you need to put all over the place, then it's kind of stable, but um, it really doesn't work very well. Once I started benchmarking it, I you know, ran into weird issues where sort of the, the performance really you know, takes a dive once you start hitting it with a sustained load of like, like 100 requests will be like really fast, 200 requests will be a bit slower, 400 will be like massively slower, and, and, and so on. And once you do like 2,000 requests per second or so, then it just completely you know, hangs or like it doesn't respond for two minutes. Um, uh, also, you have a little bit of protocol issues because these libraries, keep in mind, again, were built uh, around the time Speedy came out, before it was really called HTTP2, uh, and some of the earlier drafts of the spec. So, so some of the latest things in the browser doesn't necessarily work with this library, I found. Um, the Speedy library, that's, uh, it's got a bit more users, and it's got a little, I mean, this is just a little subjective, but I think the code base is a little bit nice structured. Um, on the flip side, it, you know, like, a search, a search in production is sort of like a debated issue, but I'm not a fan of something that can just like crash my server without any recourse. I cannot trap that error. Um, if the server receives some kind of input that it doesn't like, it just asserts and throws and blows up and crashes my whole server, I'm not going to be happy. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to put this into production. Um, also, the push API for my particular use case didn't quite satisfy my needs. I, uh, I, I wanted to play with like when do I push the, you know, when I send the promise versus when do I send the actual payload, I want to play around with that. The API isn't designed to allow that, to accommodate um, that use case. So I couldn't really get much benefit out of this. Um, so this brought me to, why don't we just have a native implementation in Node, um, in the core, right? What is the core? Well, that's basically a, a set of libraries, things like low-level constructs, um, like buffers and crypto stuff, and HTTP2 could become one of those things. Question is still, like not being answered yet, like is this, is HP2 really just a version bump or is it a whole new protocol? Because you can sort of make the case for other protocols to go into core, but they don't add them. Like WebSocket, you know, every browser supports it, a lot of applications use it, it's not part of core, right? Why not? Well, you don't really want to keep adding things to core, otherwise core will just become bloat, right? You don't want to have too much stuff in there to maintain. Uh, you know, once you start pushing stuff into Node, people will use it, 
you know, five years later, you have to support like a million applications that, that rely on this one little API. You can never change and fix things. That's a problem. So putting things into NPM is a viable strategy. If you consider it a new protocol, then say like, you know, we're gonna like leave HTTP one as part of core and never implement HTTP two in Node and always rely on people to just pull pull a dependency from uh, NPM. So again, is this actually gonna go into core? Not sure yet. Under what name? Not sure yet. Under what API design? Not sure yet. These are all things that are being discussed right now. You can go into GitHub and take part of these discussions. It's very interesting, actually. So, like I said, you don't want to break the Node ecosystem, right? So, are we going to just replace the HTTP 1 APIs? Well, you're probably going to find like a million Express apps out there that we've all been writing that are just suddenly going to break. That's not a good thing, generally speaking. So, um, the, the, uh, the current experiment that I've been uh, stalking religiously uh, is uh, the Node.js repo, so the organization, and then it's a fork called HTTP2. So it's not a pull request, it's not a branch, it's a complete fork, so you can see it's a completely separate project. It's got, um, mainly done by uh, James Snell, a uh, gentleman who works for IBM, I believe, and um, um, Michael, Michael Kalina, out of Italy, I believe. So these are the sort of the two people that are contributing to the most of, most of it right now. I'm not really a contributor to this personally, although I'd love to be. I'm really like looking at like writing some tests and making sure things work. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm kind of just sort of lurking mostly on this thing uh, and playing around with it as a from a user point of view in my own use cases that are a little bit higher level, like building a server on top of this, building some tooling on top of this. Um, so keep in mind, this is a really it's still a work in progress. It's been going on since roughly you know last summer, late last summer. Um, the server sort of works, right? API isn't frozen or anything like that. The client is currently undergoing like massive development. The tests are, you know, little to non-existent, uh, and, and we, you know, there's a, there's a lot of um, opportunities for people to contribute to something so impactful. Like if you want to have, uh, if you want to start, you know, contributing to open source to a project that could have, you know, massive implications uh, on on a huge ecosystem of Node then this is something to really look at. Write some tests, uh, you know, even just the test cases. Um, so, so this repo, this fork, tracks what's happening in um, V8, like, well, Node version 8, which is kind of confusing, because it's also V8, the JavaScript engine. Um, so uh, it, it's probably going to ship in a couple of weeks, probably going to be called Carbon, like you know the LTS names, like Argon, Boron, now it's probably going to be car uh, Carbon, still being discussed. But, um, Probably this is not going to be ready. I mean, almost almost definitely this is not going to be ready. The idea was this is going to Node version eight. Um, I sort of question that at this point, but I mean, I'm I'm crossing my fingers that would be awesome. Uh, if suddenly do people do like an insane sprint and get it, get it all done, um, but I, I sort of I'm fine working with this this fork. Uh, and if you want to play with this, just use the fork, and I'll show you how to do that. Um, the implementation itself is different from the ones that are on NPM in that it's not written in JavaScript itself. It's written in C. It's a really low-level, super high-performant implementation that's been around for a couple of years. Uh, it's used by Apache, right? So like the reference web server, essentially, uh, the de facto um, Apache mod HTTP2 uses this ng HTTP2. It's not Angular, okay? Just just want to put that out there. It's not Angular. <laughs> it's like a new generation or next generation of some Star Trek, Star Trek thing. I don't know. Uh, it's just NGHTP. It's fantastic. Uh, curl also, if you want to make HTTP two requests like on the, on the terminal, like a cool hacker, you know, use curl. Doesn't support HTTP two, right? You can get a custom plugin mod or whatever for curl that also uses this library, and that's sort of what they've said. So two of these extremely you know referency kind of projects are both using this library. It's got the pedigree, right? It's really really good stuff. Uh, it's really low level. I'm not a C programmer, so I find it hard to contribute to it, anything like this. But what it gives you is it gives a standard compliance. Like if it's good enough for Apache, it's probably good enough for you. Um, for me, anyway. Um, secondary goals, like much less for importance, at least for this initial implementation, are the performance um, and then the API design. So API design, really, like compatibility with the HTTP 1 module in Node Core is not a key concern. Like it may be originally people were thinking like we can try to overlap, but quickly people found that there's different things that we need to support, so we're not gonna prioritize that. We're just gonna try to build a cool, clean API, easy to use, so we get people to play with this more effectively. The performance side of it, I mean, while they've done a lot of work for performance optimizing, that's more on 
the sort of the JavaScript bindings to the native library. So they're not worried about the tuning the library itself, more like how do we interact, like how do we throw buffers from, that would be from, net, from network in node land, how do we throw that over to um, NGHDB2, pass things around, not, like try to avoid overhead. So that's the kind of performance. But really, when you're talking about HTTP2, the performance is going to be other things. It's going to be how do you terminate your TLS end endpoints? Because HTTP2 is all TLS. All the user agents out there, all the browsers, only support it over TLS. You have to have SSL. So you, you can't put it behind like an Nginx or a Varnish, because they don't really deal with HTTP2 upstreams. You can't have an HTTP2 server sitting behind an Nginx. You can't have an HTTP2 server sitting behind, frankly, any CDN today. You can't have it sitting behind Varnish, because none of them make upstream calls to an HTTP2 server. They only make HTTP1 or HTTPS1 if you're lucky. Um, load balancing becomes a whole new challenge, right? You have to do your own load balancing in node land, probably, or wait for new tools or build new tools. So this is why performance itself is not really the key design criteria. And then that brings me to our first demo. Like I want to, but this is very lightweight demos. I'm not going to do like a lot, a lot of live coding. I just want to put this information out there so you can play with this. And um, the first thing is like just get it working on your system. So like I said, this there's repo on GitHub, the fork. You just pull it down, run these couple of commands, you know, configure, sets it all up for your system. But, um, this takes a little while when you run make. Um, Come back and have a, have a nice cup of tea or something. You know, you come back and you should have Node 8 now running. That means you can just use, you know, you can write, you can run this uh, Node, you know, slash, you know, my, uh, sorry, you know, dot slash Node, and then give it your file.js, and it'll be running in this Node 8 pre-release type thing. Um, if you want to make it global, if you're like totally, you know, reckless, you can globally install this to be your default Node. Um, don't do that. All right, it's a really stupid idea. I've done that, but don't do that. Um, I find it easier to work with PM, uh, PM2, which is a process manager. If you've ever spun up Node application servers, you're using PM2 to sort of automatically blow it up to as many cores as you have, so it'll run in multi-processing. It'll be like you know massively faster on any modern computer. You have to run it on a server with like you know 16 cores. You know it'll run 16 processes. You don't have to change a line of your own code. It's fantastic. So to do that, you do need to have it globally available because it just calls Node on the system. It doesn't you can't pass it a specific node, as far as I know. Probably wrong about that. But anyway, um, so I'll bring out the hello world for this. Like we saw this, like the hello world for HTTP1 in node. For HTTP2, it's really simple, just you know, a dozen lines of code. And we're really not doing much new here. We're, um, you know, like I said, we're using TLS, so you have to have a key and a certificate. Uh, I can do a separate talk about how to do that. It's really, really straightforward. You generate a key and a certificate. Um, you read them from disk. You pass the options to create secure server. That's the same API as the HTTPS module in Node, right? So you have create server for the HP one plane, and then you have create secure server to spin up a TLS socket and listen onto that. That's all it's doing. Um, you get and you pass it a callback. You callback is request response. Anyone who's done Connect or, or Express programming is familiar with this underlying mechanic, right? Express is really just a callback that you plug into this function. You create a server and you get a callback. Very straightforward. That's what Express is based on. Um, now, in your response, you have the standard APIs again, right, right head. You know, you can uh, you send stuff. It's it's very standard looking kind of code, right? So all I'm doing here is saying hello world party hat thing, um, and making sure that the emoji renders with UTF-8 car set. Straightforward. And um, if I now run that. Right? And I want to see what the performance is of that, because even though I said like performance is not really the key design criteria, I was kind of curious, because right? I want to sort of see, is it better than the, than the JavaScript versions? And so I, I ran some tests, and this is very, you know, like I said, PM2 to automatically spin it up. So this is that 12 lines of code. is now a cluster of four servers right? with PM2. Um, uh, they're, they're listening on the same port, and they're all going to be handling you know, sharded kind of connections. Uh, if I run that, ngHttp2 comes with this cool, awesome tool called h2load. That's sort of an alternative to um, Apache Bench, AB, or uh, WRK, these kind of like HTTP1 benchmarking tools that sort of like just hammer like hunt millions of requests at your server and that sort of measure the response time and the error codes and stuff. So HTTP2, you use this tool called h2load. It's very efficient. So I'm making 100,000 requests coming from 100 clients on, 100, on, on 10 threads or something to my local host port 8443, because again, it's yes, so I use that as my default. It's, I don't use 8080 anymore because it gets confusing. Um, and what did I find is that on, on this little machine here that probably has less performance than most, most people's phones, um, I got 18,000 requests per second. I mean, that's 
pretty ridiculous. Uh, I wasn't getting near that with HTTP 1. I mean, you might be able to tune in and stuff, but I, I was like, 18,000 requests on this? I mean, as clients and servers are running on the same machine, I was blown away. Uh, I didn't get near like that, that, that kind of performance. I was getting like one or 2,000 with the JavaScript implementations. So this is a massive leap forward for performance already. And this hasn't even really been perfected and like, production ready yet. Uh, I was curious, what does that compare, right? What do, what do you get from Nginx? I got 12,000. All right, same thing. Like as, this is as pared down. I don't want to say Nginx sucks. I, I mean, I love Nginx. I've been using it for, you know, the best part of 10 years probably. Um, I'm just saying, like, if you pare down Nginx to like a hello world contrived, artificial, completely non-realistic example, where it's just serving a hello world text file, then I get less than with this hard-coded one. So apples and oranges, sure, but it's kind of promising, right? To me, this shows that the protocol handling of the native Node.js implementation of HTTP is really lean, really fast, and very, very good. And so, obviously, nobody's serving hello world 18,000 times per second. It'll be the world's worst web app. But, I mean, you can build things on top of this and at least be sure that this layer won't be holding you back. And so, I mean, that's sort of as far as I've uh, gone with most of my experiments and into the native uh, implementation of HP2, and I'm happy to take some questions now if we have some time. I don't know. Uh, that is just the beginning when you were talking about the state of these technologies. So there are a few uh, packages there, but then, the, then there's also uh -huh. the HTTP2 standard implementation that they're trying to make to Node 8. That's right, that's right. right. That's so 100%. Like we should go for the standard, right? Right, it's just a lot of work. Right. It's, it's work in progress. I'm sort of sharing my findings on this ongoing work. This isn't ready yet. What? You download Node, you won't get this yet. It might be six months, it could be yeah. a year, I don't know. Is, is, it, is it going to be replacing, maybe you said that, but I didn't get it. It's going to be replacing the existing HTTP package or it's going to be a new package? So that's, that's actually one of the discussion points right now. So I'm personally interested in this because I feel like this is a part where we can all contribute. And if, you, if you're interested in using this, I'm just sharing this because it's been so easy for me to do open source contributions in a sense, or at least evangelize a little bit and try to help out, like do some testing with it, give some feedback, you know, question the design, say like, should it be a package? You know, I, I, one of the issues that I discussed on was, for example, should it you know, be a namespace? Should we replace the ones on Node with, with this thing, uh, on, on NPM rather? Should we replace the NPM packages with this native one? But then we're breaking the API, and if, if these things have you know, hundreds of thousands of downloads, that might still upset a lot of people. Even though you're not breaking Node, you're still breaking a heavily relied upon package. That's not a really nice thing to do. And so like, there's all these, these kind of uh, you know, things that, that people are sort of discussing right now, and I'm just saying, like, you can be part of this. Like, you can just sit back and say, like, you know, the world will go on, and magically things will get better, but you can also just make things better, and you can be part of that ongoing world. Do browsers have to support HTTP2 in order to use it? Of course. Um, I mean, yeah. why is it? They do. They actually do. Like, uh, this is like sort of unrelated to the Node side, but it's very interesting. So, Chrome, Firefox, and Safari, since uh, the last version that came out a few months back, all support it. Edge, uh, I think I don't know about IE, but Edge at least definitely supports it. So, in my tests, I've been I've been interested in this because I'm using um, a bundling tool to replace sort of Webpack Browserify, and I'm just using Server Push, building on top of this technology, and it works with every browser. It's beautiful. I mean, it's the support is there. Like, it's it's complete. Like, if you're worried about backwards compatibility, you care about like IE 3.2 or something, you know, like you got help. But this works with the current, you know, green, you know, whatever browsers. So currently, when we build web applications with all these gazillions of uh, web services, we usually hide. Uh, a bunch of node servers behind the varnish on, on Nginx. Uh, what's going to happen? Because, like, so as you said, uh, Nginx and varnish don't do HTTP2 up, uh, upstream. Uh, are we have to put a, a Node.js as, as a new front end, or what, what would you do? I, th I think it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation, maybe. Like, they're not sure if they should implement it. So, the browsers actually have taken the lead on this. Um, people in the varnish community, node community, they've got very strong opinions, you know, on, on, on they don't agree with necessarily everything in the protocol. No, I don't think anyone really agrees with such a, you know, hotly debated spec. But um, for me, I'm just running Node, you know, no no varnish, no uh, Nginx. I'm just running Node to talk to H, talk, to talk HTTP2. So you're using Node basically then to distribute uh, the various. Uh, so typically, I have, for example, the customer is port five five three. 
folder 554. Oh, but, 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 but the browser, of course, only talks to 443. So you would use a node application to then do the distribution, what you typically do with, like, say, Varnish or Nginx today. That's right, that's right. I mean, there's so many different strategies. So, yeah. And so people are going to have to experiment with that. And at some point, maybe Varnish or something will change their mind. But I mean, they haven't even implemented HTTPS, so I could be. I'd be surprised if they implemented it too, but someone else might. And then that person's project might become like, the thing for them, the next varnish for the next 10 years. Right? So what about Nginx? Does it support? So Nginx is interesting in that it supports HTTP connections inbound, but when it upstreams, when you like, when you, like you know, you're, you're like an Nginx load balancer to your application server, that connection is still going to be HTTP 1.1 or HTTPS 1.1, and so not HTTP 2. And so that's actually what a lot of the sort of the major CDNs that you're using. Uh, they're actually built upon you know, things like things like Nginx, maybe a little bit modified and stuff, but core technology tend, tends to be Nginx. And that's why they never make HTTP2 connections to your origin server. So they might receive client connections at HTTP2 and send things back to HTTP2, but they won't really talk HTTP2 to you. So you can't really do those optimizations necessarily. So, um, more? Okay. so okay. have you heard any news that uh, Nginx will be able to uh, include the HTTP two features. It, it does. It, so, like I, I mean, said, it, it, it's like we did this few months. Or? I'm not. A, I'm not really involved with in Nginx at all. Um, <laughs> but uh, like, it has supported HTTP two client connections for for the longest time now. I mean, in, in terms of including like upstream. Oh, so in terms of upstream, I don't. Like the comments that I've read might be a little bit dated by now, but um, I, I'm not sure if the opinion has changed. They're not really implementing that. They're not really interested, I think. But I, I suspect that a lot of the CDN companies would be happy to sponsor that kind of development. Um, I mean, some CDNs already have, like switched over to other servers like H2O, like Fastly, like uses H2O. So that's, a, that's a bit curious, really. I mean, like, where's the point of building an application that uses HTTP2 with that like half between my load balancer and my backend? Well, you could question: Do you really need that load balancer? You know, are there alternative ways to do that? Can you just do DNS round robin, and you know, are there other ways to like lo do a load balancing at a lower level, TCP level, perhaps? Yeah, it works. Yeah, for example. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? I think we have the next speaker has shown up. So it's a bit more time. Any other questions? I, don't know, I think everyone's waiting for the next speaker, so I think that's okay. All right. Thank you, Thanks, Sebastian.